Well, thank you so much for tuning in today to this special, special broadcast. It's going to be powerful over the next two weeks. We're so excited to take you into our Take Me Back revival. It's our throwback version, but we are doing some things to highlight a lot of what's going on in our ministry around our senior saints. You know, one of the things that allows a ministry to grow successfully is not just after a certain demographic only, but also understand the balance by which ministry must grow. Mount Zion has been blessed since 1866 to have a very diverse congregation intergenerationally. And for us, we discovered something. When you honor the senior saints and you never forget the pillars of your church, God continues to bless. And that's what he's done in the Mount Zion church. These two weeks are going to be about honoring our senior saints. You're going to be hearing some powerful testimonies. You're going to see some amazing things that they're doing. Let me tell you something. The senior saints of Mount Zion are so involved. The Lord's Kitchen program provides food for folks in the North Nashville area every week. I mean, they literally are making it possible for folks who have food insecurity to get food. A lot of folks don't know that every single week our seniors facilitate this awesome ministry. And not only that, but our Meals on Wheels program, taking food where people need it the most. This is amazing, and I'm excited to see so many of our seniors engaged in this process. And it's just a blessing to watch lives be changed. I'm thankful to God, and I want all of our seniors, if you are a person who is 65 and up, I want you to know how you can get connected in our Senior Saints ministry with all the amazing things that are going on. Lucretia Smith oversees this area for us, and she's doing an amazing job. Lucretia, come tell them how they can get connected. Thank you, Bishop. Greetings to my Mount Zion Church family. I am Lucretia Smith, overseer of the Senior Ministry. We want all of our senior members to know that we are here for you. Even though we're in the virtual space, we still want to continue to connect with you and ensure you that your church family is here to assist you. Our membership service team has made numerous of phone calls to our senior members to check in on you to see how you're doing and if you had any needs. If you have not received a phone call yet, no worries. Our team is willing to connect with you. We have resources available for our senior members regarding food pantries and delivery of groceries for homebound seniors. Also, our flock leaders and prayer ministry are in place to connect with you to cover you in prayer and offer spiritual guidance. Seniors, if you have a need, please call the church office at 615-254-7296 so our team can connect with you regarding resources and prayer. You may also email me directly at lsmith at mtzionnashville.org. We love our senior members and we thank God for each one of you. To God be the glory. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I don't know about you, but I love these songs. And if you don't mind, all over the world, let's just lift it up together. Come on.
Revival here in Mount Zion is just fantastic. I enjoy the, the uh, yearly revivals. Love to hear Reverend Black. He's a great evangelist. And just the fervor of the time is just fabulous. The Lord is in the house. He is really in the house. Revival was like deliverance, repentance, and soul searching. Revival was uh, spiritual. Well, as a child, I used to go to revival with my grandmother. And all I know is there was always a lot of joy and singing and praising and just brought a warm feeling to my heart. It was just a soul st stirring kind of service. And uh, I remember souls being saved during revivals here at Mount Zion.
Easter parade that we had every Easter Sunday before Sunday school. We would start marching, go up to 12th and Jefferson by the drugstore and march down to the church and around the church to the side door and come in and have church to by a uh, Sunday school. One was uh, Easter Sunday, I think I was around five years old. And you know how we coming up in the Baptist churches, we get those Easter speeches. And I wasn't called to get my give my speech and I cried. So that was my big, big remembering uh, coming up as a child. One of my the thing was uh, we're doing the Easter program. I had a speech to say. As a child, I attended BTU, and that was fun. Of course, I had always been a part of the church uh, as a child, and um, that five o'clock BTU was a time when we went right back. We had been in service all day, and we had to turn around and go right back for that, and we had food, we had fellowship, and it was just fun. I remember a time when we had homemade chili and everybody had to literally run home because it was that delicious. <laughs> well, I'll always remember uh, teachings during um, BTU, uh, especially early on with Bishop. Uh, one of the ones that lasted more than a month or so was uh, teaching us how to tithe and why we should tithe. Sin 
that I should die. But grace and mercy said, oh no, oh no, no. Now, you know that was a blessing. My goodness, Woo, we are so strengthened by those testimonies. Listen, I want to give you an opportunity now uh, as we continue to move forward in this service. And thank you for watching right here on this platform. I want you to prepare your hearts as you prepare to sow and to give. You know, one of the things that I am keenly aware of is that our senior saints are givers. And you want to understand why they've been blessed over these years, because they have never forgotten to put God first. Today we have an opportunity, all of us, to sow seed. And of course, here's the text to give information right there on the screen. I want you to text to give if you want to do that or if you can mail your offering in. Mail it to 7594 Old Hickory Boulevard, Whites Creek, Tennessee. Uh, care of our finance department, Mount Zion Church. We want you to do that. Be a part. Let's sow in a way that brings glory to God. I want everybody to at least give a seed of $20. Who's watching, whatever time you're watching, let's do that for the kingdom of God. This is our legacy, y'all. And we're going to continue to push forward, propelling ourselves into destiny. Let's give now. I want you to receive one of my favorite gospel artists. I had to have her come because she is a gift of the kingdom of God, the one and only Crystal Rucker. Come on and clap your hands if you love Jesus. Oh, you can do better than that. Clap your hands if you love him. Hallelujah. God is great and greatly to be praised. I'm not going to detain you with lengthy words. I love the Lord. I'm glad that I'm saved. And I'm glad to be back here again. Thank you, Bishop Joseph Walker, for allowing me to come. And I give honor to you tonight and to our guests and to each of you. I'm going to sing and sit down. That's what I do. Put me in A flat. OK, this is an old song. And I need your help. Is that all right? Will you help me? I know you know it. And I'm just glad that he changed my life complete. And now I sit, sit at his feet. I'm gonna do. For I must work and work until he comes. And it's wonderful. Everybody sing. Therefore, if you've been changed, sing it.
Is anybody else in here saved besides me? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you always been saved? Well, the thing is, y'all acting like it because when I said, thank God, thank God. Thank God, thank God. He didn't have to do it, but he did. He didn't have to save me, but he did. He didn't have to love me, but he did. somebody that had a baby out of wedlock. If it had not been for Jesus, because the saints wanted to kill me, if it had not been for Jesus, I want to know where. Maybe I need to change that. The ain'ts wanted to kill me. The saints loved me. But the church folks wanted to kill me because I was, I had messed up. But God took that thing that the devil thought would kill me and turned it around for my good. I just want you all to be glad about your process. Because if you hadn't gone down that road, you wouldn't know Jesus the way you know him today. And I'm on my way to my seat. I don't know how much time I got left, but I will not overstay my time. I'll never do that. Holy Ghost is intelligent, but I want to tell you this. My daughter is 22 years old now. I raised her by myself. She'll be graduating from college in May. If it had not been for Jesus, Thank you. 
in this. Everybody point to yourself and say, me. Wow, let me tell you, whew, thank you so much. It is time for us now to get ready for the word of the Lord. And I'm telling you, I'm so excited because Pastor Tellis Chapman blessed us a few years ago. And we're going to let you hear this word. You talk about a word that will shake you at the core. This word is going to be a blessing. He's from Detroit, Michigan, the Galilee Church there. And He's a dear friend, and he is certainly a preacher's preacher. He's a man of God, just good old-fashioned, straight word preacher. You're going to be blessed. If there's a praise in you, let it out, will you? If there's a praise in your hands, put them together. If there's a praise on your lips, shout hallelujah. God bless you. You can sit down if you can. If you can't, I understand. What a gift. What passion. Honorable pastor, friend, and bosom brother, Bishop Walker, and to the charming, sweet, sweet-spirited First Lady, Sister Walker, to the leadership and laity of the wonderful, kind, historic, and electric Mount Zion Baptist Church, my brothers and sisters who are sharing as guests tonight how sweet it is to be a child of God and to have this privilege to gather together in this sacred spot to celebrate him for who he is for all that he has done historically for all that he is doing existentially and for all that he will do it is an honor to be here in this space, having been invited by such a noble spirit, a giant in the faith, one whom I have great admiration, regard, and respect for, in my opinion, as I've shared with so many others in conference settings, as a model for ministers and pastors, Joe Walker's name is a first mention. Amen. And that's, uh, that's not to flatter him or swell his head, but when you are a model and a pattern and a paradigm and an example, then you become a great reference for those who are trying to succeed in ministry and you are a blessed people as I've shared with you before and I'll say it again you're a blessed people hold on those were guest clapping because I know Mount Zion know their pastor they know what they got they know what they got they know Not too far from Shreveport, Louisiana, but profound and progressive and productive, nevertheless. And I thank God for the humbling invitation. I bring you nothing new. We've been blessed tonight by this lyrical expression personified in this great singer tonight. That's, that just, let church say that don't make no sense. Amen. I thank you again for your warm welcome and reception. I've got people here somewhere. In fact, uh, there are some who've relocated 
from Michigan who are now residents of uh, Nashville, Sister Cribs, I don't know where you are, somewhere staying his rest of the family with you. Amen. This young lady just relocated here from our church, a sweet, sweet spirit, Tither. 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 Amen. And uh, in her search for a church, um, I did, of course, without reservation, hesitation, ambivalence, second guessing, or misgiving, mention Mount Zion Baptist Church and Bishop Joe Walker. Because I know she will get the best of care and oversight, so get, get familiar with her face, hug her, embrace her and her husband and family as they're wonderful people. I see others here from Detroit. I want you all to stand up. Jimmy, you all show them some love. Everybody's leaving Detroit, coming to warm weather. Amen. The leaves are already changing in Detroit. There's crisp in the air. I mean, y'all just enjoying shirt sleeve weather. We're almost about to make it to the deep freeze. So, amen. But thank you for being who you are and what you are. And I dare not belinger the moment. But commendations to this pastor and bishop for his new assignment and for his continued leadership for this great congregation. Somebody, I think I heard two amens. But it's all right. You, you waiting for the punchline? That's the punchline. <laughs> Amen. I need you to do two things for me tonight. One, I need you to pray for me and with me. You going to do that? Amen. You promise? All right, next thing I need you to do is lean over and tell your neighbor how much they owe you for letting them sit next to you tonight. <laughs> Go ahead and tell them, collect, collect, put your hand out and tell them, pay me now, pay me now, credit card, debit, I take it all. Come on, give God some praise in this place. Pray with me if you will. God our Father, thank you now for this day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sparing our lives. Thank you for granting us grace and giving us new mercies. Forgive us for our fault and failures. Please accept our prayers and our praise in this place we need to hear a word from you tonight speak Lord in this place that we your people may be revived that the unsaved would be convicted and convinced that you're real and that you are to be praised get your glory in this place tonight as your word goes forth, grant us the essentials to deliver it, the capacity to receive it, and the ability to make it practical. We're already committed to give you the praise, therefore. This is your servant's prayer, I pray, in the strong and saving, sound, serene, and sagacious, and stupendous, and superlative name of Jesus, the people of God said amen. If you have your Bibles, there's a word in the 100th Psalm. The 100th Psalm, I commend those of you for standing to give honor to the reading of God's word. When you get in the privacy of your own praying ground, I challenge you to peruse that passage, verses 1 through 5, over and over and over. Again, they will bless your heart. When you get to the last clause of the fourth verse, these are the words you will see. And bless his name. That's good. You could be seated. Thank you. <laughs> the 
Lean over to your neighbor, left or right, shake a hand. If you're not antisocial, tell them these words, neighbor. You have bragging rights. Now give God some praise for what he's getting ready to tell you. In his office, the celebrated writer, author, producer, and movie director, Alex Haley, had a painting of a turtle sitting on a fence post. Having been asked by a journalist as of what was the meaning of the painting of a turtle on a fence post. His response was these now famous words. If you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he had to have some help. Somebody helped him. Such words from the writer Alex Haley translates into our own everyday practical predicaments and circumstance of progress. It speaks to the fact that none of us are independent. Wherever you are in life tonight, you didn't get there on your own. Lest we sport some air of arrogance, become conceited, cocky, narcissistic, and nefarious, and dangerously cerebrally protruded. That's to say any bonics get the big head. We wouldn't be where we are today if we didn't have some help. Somebody had to help you. There is a mother who prayed for you. There's a father who put up with you. There's a provider who took care of you. There's a police who didn't arrest you. There's a judge who didn't sentence you. There's a teacher who didn't flunk you. There's a principal who didn't expel you. There's a friend holding all your dirty little secrets. You didn't get where you are on your own. Somebody had to help you. There's a preacher who preached to you, taught you. There's an old saint somewhere who went in a corner somewhere and went into intercessory prayer and prayed for you. So you can take your pseudo halo off of your head, hanging on the nearest nail, shout hallelujah with your neighbor because you didn't get where you are today by yourself. And if there's anyone who deserves all the credit for our getting where we are and are having excelled to such elevations in life and nearly reaching our personal euphorias. God deserves all the credit. You didn't quite feel me, did you? I said if there's anyone who deserves all of our homage and honor and adoration and praise, it is the God who helped us to get where we are. It is he who has blessed you and took care of you and shielded you and showered you with endowments. It is he who answered your prayers and it is he who lifted your burden. It is he who dried your tear-stained cheeks and opened doors that were closed in your face. And it is he who helped you to bear your heavy load. It is he who made a way out of no way. It is he who made your enemies your footstool. It is he who picked you up and turned you around. It is he who saved your sin-sick soul. It is he who woke your no saying amen self up this morning and told you in the right mind and started you on your way. It is he who did for you what nobody else could do. If there's anybody who deserves praise, it is your God who did it for you. And since he did it, somebody in this house tonight ought to be testifying to somebody else near you as of what the Lord has done for you. 
You want to go old school? Here is what they used to say in the, as they sang in the old wood floor church without carpet on the floor, cushion on the pew, powerful PA systems and shining chandeliers and an educated preacher. They said something like this. You don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know because you weren't there. You don't know when and you don't know where. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. This is what the psalmist infers, implies, suggests, admonishes, and urges in this passage of Psalms 100, which is actually a doxological expression of a series of hymns that were actually launched in Psalms 94. And as the writers thereof, a writer, pen as of the reason and theological rationale as to why any recipient of the goodness and unlimited love and glorious grace and unmitigated mercy and uncalculated kindness and contributions of the creator for their own creature comfort or to respond and retort what the God has done for them with some expressions of honor and praise and adoration. Now conceited people can't do that. Arrogant people can't do that. Cocky people won't do that because they think it's because of the dead presidents in their pockets. They think it's because of the letters and commas and semicolons and acronyms listed for a mile behind their name. But somebody in the house is humble enough to know that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, Beginning with Psalm 94, the writer urges the praises to express adoration and honor unto God because he's a God of vengeance. And he's a God who redeems. And he's a God who gives you new songs that is, that is testimony. And by the time the psalmist gets to Psalm 100, he expresses doxology and urges praise by pinning these lyrical expressions, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Tell your neighbor that means you too. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful unto him and bless his name you know the lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations that is to say beloved you have right and reason let me try my right side you have the right and reason let me go back and get them you have the right and reason to give praise unto god now where are you? You didn't quite identify. You live in a you live in a city wherein there are teams on the collegiate level and professional level that engage in sports venues, football and basketball and the like. And in the event of teams playing their conference rivals, whoever the victor is can for at least 364 days rub it in the loser's face in that they have been hailed as victors and possibly champions which says from colloquial expression of those in sports genre that they have bragging rights now i didn't come tonight to talk to losers I can't help you. I've got nothing for you. I came tonight to talk to winners. Sick, got well, you won. Broke, the Lord healed you, you won. He put you together, you won. Now, if you're a winner tonight, 
Lean over and tell the one who's retired, reclusive, reserved, withdrawn, and have ambivalence about praising God that you have some bragging rights. Where are the winners? I, I thought winners cheered. I thought winners just acted crazy. Didn't the Lord bless you? Didn't he bring you out? Didn't he turn it around? Didn't he make a way? Tell somebody you have bragging rights. You can sit down if you can. If you can't, I understand. This is what is, is intricately enveloped, intrinsically enveloped in this last clause of verse 4 of Psalm 100. As the writer said, bless. It comes from the Hebrew word, barak. Let the church say, barak. It literally means to kneel in adoration with the objective of conveying praise to the object of the praise. You didn't feel me? One kneels because they are paying homage to the one who has been their benefactor. And since they have been their benefactor and they're not being able to reciprocate the deed with any tangible expression that never will be equivalent to the blessing that they receive. So what do they do? They bow on their knees right before their benefactor and give praise to the one because that's all they got. Lean over and tell somebody, you can't pay God back for everything he's done for you, but there is something you can do. You can open your mouth, you can lift your holy hand, and you can tell the Lord, thank you. Because you have, help me preach tonight, bragging rights. I thank God for that, Bishop, in that he's given me some bragging rights and some things that I can testify about because considering the sinister and soil and spoil and sophomoric and satanically saturated scenarios that are going on in our sin-sick society, there are some things I can't brag about. You didn't feel me? I can't brag about Pookie and Ray Ray who walks around with their pants hanging around their knees attempting to express some fickle and faded fad and fashion and exposing their dirty laundry to go along with it and possibly an ill-fated anatomical accoutrement as well. I can't brag on a Supreme Court who can snuff its nose in the air at God and tell God he got it wrong about the definition of marriage and can legalize Brokeback Mountain and give Mike and Ike right to have marriage license. Help me preach to anybody on your road. Tell them I can't brag on that. I can't brag on those who've been sworn in the office to protect and to serve, and who with badges, bars, and bullets would take out black lives defenselessly on the street and then court some grand jury who's led by some perverted prosecutor who can argue their case to get them off the hook so as to put them back on the street to take another brother out. I cannot brag on those who were burned down Ferguson, Missouri, and Charlotte, North Carolina, and St. Louis, Missouri, in the name and under the caption of Black Lives Mattering. And while black lives do matter, that's not the only thing that matters. Your black vote matters. Your black dollar matters. Your black community matters. Your black church matters. Your black schools matter. Your black teacher matters. 
Your black family matters. Your black child matters. Pulling up your pants over your black behind. That matters. You know and tell somebody I can't brag on that. I can't brag on the fact that a light-skinned brother who now has ascended as a leader of his political party, who now wants to become the most powerful person in the free world, who can boast braggadociously and belligerently and bellicociously of not only his billions, but from the culture that produced him and who has the egregious gall, guts, and chitlins to have as a campaign mantra that he wants to make America great again. I've got a question for homeboy. What do you mean great again? How does that sound in the ears of the Native American who was chased on the reservation having had their own properties taken away? How does that sound to women who do the same work as men but won't ever get the same pay? How does that sound to people in my community who worked for 246 years and you still hadn't paid me yet? What do you mean great again? Do you mean to tell me that we've got to get to the back of the bus when you get on the bus again? Do you mean to tell me we've got to get off of the sidewalk when we see you coming again? Do you mean to tell me we've got to go back to the cotton fields and work from can to can again? Do you mean to tell me you got to beat the hell out of us and preach to us on Sunday morning again? Lean over and tell somebody we ain't driving Miss Daisy no more. of late and of late and of late he has courted a couple of african-american congregations not to slight any other under the guise of establishing a relationship with the african-american community i've got another question for homeboy where were you on bloody sunday where were you when we crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge? Where were you when we marched on Washington? Where were you when Martin King took a bullet in the jaw in Memphis? Where were you when Medgar Evers took a bullet in the back? Where were you when we tried to get the voting rights bill passed? If you were not interested in my community before then, you sure as hell not interested in my community now. Can I get a witness? That's why you need something worth bragging about. The psalmist said, bless his name. Well, now that poses a question for me. Bishop, what is his name? You know, Moses almost got in trouble once, having met God by having been attracted to what he thought was a brush fire and having made his way to the site of what he thought was a brush fire, but actually turned out to have been a bush that burned but wouldn't burn up. And he knew that there was something odd about the incident in that it not only burned but wouldn't burn up, but it took on auditorial and vocal propensity and spoke to him from the branches. And Moses discovered that God was occupying the bush. And having been arrested and attracted by the bush and then assigned by God from the bush to go to Egypt to liberate God's people and lead them to the promised land, 
he had to go to ask God for his name. And God responded in my black colored African American Negro Baptist preaching eavesdropping imagination. Told Moses that names are for men and people and not God. In that he said, when you go down to Egypt, I'll introduce myself in a series. And by the time I shall have finished introducing myself, Pharaoh will know who I am. You didn't feel me? I didn't expect you to feel me. You got to go back and get Grandmama Nim's theology in that they didn't know all of the nuances and the appellations that were applied to God's identity. But beloved, whenever the Lord does for you, whatever the Lord does for you, you won't have to ask for a name, you'll give him one yourself. Talk to me somebody. That's what the old people meant and the old church meant when they called God names like lean and pole. It's because they got weak and had nobody else to call on. You, if the Lord does for you what he does for you, when he does for you, what he does for you, you'll come up with your own name. Somebody on my left has a name for him right now. You've been calling him way out of nowhere. Somebody in this section, you've been calling him a doctor in a sick room. Somebody on my right, you've been calling him a lawyer in a courtroom. Somebody behind me, you've been calling him a friend that stick closer than a brother. When he makes a way out of nowhere, you'll come up with your own name. Abraham said, if you just need one, let me drop a name on you. Genesis 22, 14, Moses ha uh, Abraham having taken, having taken his son Isaac to a mountain summit to offer him up for sacrifice. But having gotten there and preparing the altar, having raised his knife, stops in mid expression in that he is distracted by a noise and a rattling from a nearby bush. Having gazed over his shoulder, he saw a ram caught in a thicket. Abraham said, I need a name for this place. I'll call it Jehovah Jireh. Because the Lord will provide. Wait. Some of you in this place right now, you're on a mountain summit. You're not making a sacrifice. Here is the implication in your own practical predicament in that as Abraham offered his only son Isaac, in that Isaac was his only son of promise, the Lord was leading Abraham to the point to where he would eliminate any option. You didn't get it. In that he would eliminate any option, he had nowhere else to go but to God and no one else upon whom he could depend but God. You still don't feel me? Here it is, here it is. When you have exhausted every option, that's the only time you see that the Lord can provide. As long as you got a dollar in your pocket, you got an option. As long as you've got someone to call on, you got an option. But when your friends fade and your family fail and your finances are depleted, you have no more options and you have no choice but to rely upon the Lord. But I need about four witnesses, I'll make five, who won't mind testifying that when you ran out, God provided. Let me try my left side. That's a weak witness on my right side. When you didn't have anything else going for you, didn't the Lord provide it? Let's go back and get him. Didn't the Lord make a way out of nowhere? Did he work it out? Won't he do it? You didn't have way answer me. Won't he do it? God will provide. I know he will. If I had time, I would have elaborated upon the fact that he'll provide joy for your sorrow. He'll provide hope for your despair. He'll provide salvation for your sin. He'll provide faith for your doubt. He will provide. Because I know what he's done for me. 
You want to have some bragging rights? You didn't answer me. Moses said, I got a name for you. When Moses was leading Israel into battle as they were fighting the Amalekite nation, Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, Moses is seated by Aaron and her on a rock that's elevated above the battle site. While Joshua is fighting in the valley, Moses raises his hands up under God and before the Israeli army, and they began to prevail in battle over the Amalekite nation. But Moses' humanity got the best of him, and his elbows began to droop, and the hands began to fall, and the Amalekite nation began to prevail and take momentum over the Israeli nation. Aaron and her rushed to Moses and got under each arm and they raised his arms back up and Israel regained momentum and won the battle. You still didn't feel me. Come here for a minute. Don't try to come up in here, up in here as though you're the holiest thing in the house tonight. Your humanity got the best of you too. Let me try my right side. And when your humanity got the best of you, you begin to lose in the battle. Oh, praise his holy name. When any nation went out to do battle, Bishop, every nation fought under a flag. But Israel didn't have a banner. But even though they didn't have a banner, they had the blessing. Let me try my left side now. Tell your neighbor, I'm not fighting under a banner. I'm fighting under the blessing. And sometimes your humanity gets the best of you. And even though others have perceived you as being the most perfect, pious person in the place today and have declared that you're a paragon of perfection, lean over and correct them. Tell them I don't have a halo on my head. My humanity got the best of me. But here is the reason why you ought to be bragging. The Lord let you win anyway. Wait, let me talk to the winners. I want to talk to winners. You know you were dirty, low down, did things you didn't have any business, but he still let you win. Can I tell you how good God is? God is the only one I know who will see you lose the race and still let you touch the tape. God is the only one I know who will watch you strike out and still let you run the bases. God is the only one I know who will see you lose the contest and still let you hold up the trophy. God is the only one I know who will see you flunk the test and still give you an A. I need about nine people, I'll make 10, who won't mind shouting, he looked beyond my faults. That shout's not good enough, let me try my left side. Tell somebody, he looked beyond my faults. That's almost all right. Let me turn behind me. He looked beyond my thoughts. He saw my needs. Can I get away with that? Gideon said, if you need a name, I've got one. In Judges chapter 6, verse 24, Gideon, while threshing out wheat, was in the hiding under an oak tree. And God paid him an angelic visit. I need somebody to shout, the angel came to visit. When the angel got there, knowing the reason as to why Gideon was hiding, in that all of Israel were hiding, in that the Midianite nation had raided their camps and their farmland, and taken out lives at will. Therefore, they had to hide in caves for residence and hide their crop for plumage. And the angel paid Gideon a visit and said to Gideon, the Lord is with you. In my black colored African-American Negro Baptist preaching eavesdropping imagination, I heard the dialogical exchange that went on between Gideon and the angel. Gideon said, you must not see what's happening, homie. You must not see what's going on. The angel responded, the Lord knows what's going on. 
and he has come to bring about peace among his people. And God will fight for you against the Amalekite nation and the Midianite nation. You still didn't feel me. The Lord says to Gideon, I won't kill them all off, but I'm going to keep them from killing you. You don't know what peace is, do you? Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is disallowing trouble from getting in you. Gideon said, I've got to call this place a name. I call it Jehovah Shalom, which means God brings about peace. Do I have a witness here? Moses called the site of the battle Jehovah Nisi in that God is my banner. Gideon said, I'll call this spot Jehovah Shalom in that the Lord does not take us all away from our trouble, but he will disallow your trouble from taking over you. I'll tell you this and I'm gonna bid you good night. If you are a great fan of poetry, you have come across the works of Victor Hugo, who on one occasion saw a bird sitting on a broken or half broken limb that was being swayed by floodwaters during a heavy rain. And he observed that the beak of the bird was halfway open, suggesting that the bird was singing in the rain. Hugo began to write, Sister Walker, on a limb that swings sits a bird that sings knowing that it has wings. You still don't get it. The bird knew that the minute that the limb would break, the bird didn't have to panic because the bird had what it took to fly away, to rest. Come here for a minute. God will not always take you out of your circumstance, but he will allow your circumstance from taking over you. I need about three people, I'll make four, who won't mind shouting, I've got peace like a river. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught, me to say it's well. Do you mind helping me to preach to anybody on your row? Lean over and tell them if it's all right with God, it's all right with me. If God said I can handle it, I can handle it. God bless your heart, I'm out of here tonight. God has given you what it takes to fan function and move forward in that he won't kill off the things that are going on around you. He just disallows the things from killing you. Oh, praise his holy name. Gideon said, I've got to call this place Jehovah Shalom because the Lord is peace. Got to bid you good night, beloved. Not out of preaching, just out of time. And don't mean to keep you here all night long, but I need to tell you, David said, I got a name. Yeah. Psalms 23 verse 1. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And because he leads me in the green pastures of plenty. And because he leads me besides still waters of peace. And because he leads me in the paths of righteousness for good practice. And because he anoints my head with oil. And because he allows my cup of joy to overflow. And because he leadeth me, yes, and even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid because the Lord is with me. And because I know that he prepares a table of plenty for me in the presence 
of every hater I got and because he's got my back by providing me with goodness and mercy I got to give the Lord a name he said I call him Jehovah Roy he is my primary caretaker he is my shepherd if you're not too mean lean over and shake somebody's hand and tell them the Lord is my caretaker good evening Mount Zion it's been good being here with you but I heard Ezekiel saying don't leave me out because if you need another name I've got a name I want to share with you in Ezekiel 48 35 he says that after Israel had made it to the promised land and all of the land was being allocated and all of the land was being assessed and all of the land was being assigned he said now I see that the Lord is present in this place and he said I've got to give this place a name and I call it Jehovah Shema that means the Lord is there shake somebody's hand and tell them there is a way that the Lord has to prove to you that he is present oh bless the lamb and just in case we try to take credit for where we are today I serve notice on you tonight the only reason you are where you are tonight is simply because the Lord was there oh praise his name when the zephyr breezes of Eden blew upon the anatomies of Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden the Lord was there when a family of faith was shut up in an ark for 40 days and nights while waters poured down and waters arose the Lord was there the reason a prophet named Daniel could go in a den of lions on a dinner menu and come out uh, having had a sleepover is simply because the Lord was there. The reason why Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego could go in a fiery furnace and be fireproofed for the flames of the fire and have fellowship while they're walking around in the flames is simply because the Lord was there. Paul and Silas got out of jail after being put in jail and having nothing going for them but a wing and a prayer. But at the stroke of midnight, they sang and they prayed and the prayer meeting took wings and made its way to the throne of grace and shook up the earth, caused an earthquake, shook jail cells wide open, shook chains off of prisoners. They walked out scot-free because the Lord was there. The reason why you woke up this morning uh, clothed in your right mind is simply because the Lord was there. He threw his loving arms of protection all around you shake somebody's hand and tell your neighbor i'm not by myself the lord is with me i leave you when i tell you a young man walking home one night was confronted by a stranger oh praise his name the stranger asked him for a light for a cigarette the man pulled out a match he struck the match and lit the cigarette. The man said, thank you. He went on home that night and turned on the news broadcast. And lo and behold, the same man that he met on the corner was the same man that was in the news 
for having taken another man's life. He got out of his seat. He made his way to the police station. He made inquiry about the man that had just killed a man a few hours before. They found out who he was. He said, that's the same man I saw a little while ago. I gave him a light for a cigarette. I'd like to ask him a question. Oh, praise his name. They gave him an audience. He asked the young man, I saw you on the corner. You asked me for a light. And a little while later, you took another man light. He said, I got a question for you. Why didn't you take my light? He said, I know I intended to take your light, but I saw you strike the match. And when you struck a match, I saw another man standing behind you. Oh, praise his name. Shake somebody's hand and tell your neighbor, I'm not by myself. The Lord is with me. I've got to give him a name. He sticks by your side. He'll never leave you alone. I need about two people. I'll make three who won't mind giving God some praise and adoration because he never, he never, he never left me alone. Is it anybody in the house ready to call his name? Can you call his name? I heard Paul saying in Philippians 4 and 9, he said, I got another name for you. For the Lord God has given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. If you know he's Lord, go ahead and give him praise. He said there is a name and no other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. Save the name of Jesus. Isaiah said, I got a name. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, unto us a child is born and his name shall be called a wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace now i need two people uh, lean over to your neighbor and tell them i don't know what you call him but i've got a name way out of nowhere he's a living bread that will never mold he's the light of the world that will never go out he's the living water that will never taint he's the true vine that will never wither he's the resurrection that will never die he is the way that will never go wrong do i have a witness here call the lord he has a name god bless your heart god i bid you good day oh praise his name some of you here tonight you heard about the, the queen bee otherwise beyonce knows but before she became the queen bee she used to sing with the hit group entitled destiny's child she sang with destiny's child and destiny's child put out a song entitled say my name if you know me say my name i don't know who beyonce was talking about but i do know who woke me up this morning i do know who made a way out of nowhere somebody here know his name if you know who he is what's his name if he made a way for you say his name if he brought you out say his name if he made a way say his name if he saved your soul what his name if he made a way out of nowhere shout his name yeah
I hope you were blessed by today's Bible study. You know, we're very excited to bring this word into your life, particularly in this season where all of us are social distancing and attempting to uh, abide by what the CDC is asking us to do. But the word of God is so important in all of our lives. And what I want you to do is I want you to let me know if this message has blessed you. Stay connected with me at Joseph Walker 3 on Instagram, my wife, Dr. Steph Walker. We love to connect with you. And also, you have an opportunity right now to give. If you haven't done that, please, sow into what God is blessing you with. We want to be able to continue to reach more souls for Jesus Christ. You help us do that. Right here is the text to give information. Thank you so much for watching it, and we can't wait to share another word with you.